The cordyceps fungus in The Last of Us is one of the strangest fungi that there is. And the thing is, that's saying a lot. Fungus are bizarrely weird. They're over a billion years old based on the first fossils we have of them. And from that time, they've filled a lot of different niches. There's some that are pretty obvious. They eat already dead things. This is the ones that you see growing on the sides of trees that are already dead or just growing kind of on the detritus and leaf matter that's at the bottom of forests. But there's also a lot more. There's single-celled fungi. Think of yeast. There's also many fungi that are actually symbiotic. They live with trees and essentially help give certain nutrients to the trees and get certain nutrients from the trees. There's even parasitic fungus that infect whales and dolphins, so there's nowhere that's safe really. But then there's obviously, of course, things like cordyceps that are parasitic. And the thing is, cordyceps is the only one that does this whole zombie thing, and it really only does that in a few species, but that's saying a lot because there's a lot of parasitic fungus that have very significant effects. For example, Batactrochytrium is this fungus that actually infects amphibians, especially salamanders and frogs. In fact, there's been researchers who have gone back to where this fungus was introduced and found no frogs. Like, just there weren't any left because they had already died and their bodies rotted away. They just weren't there anymore. It's so severe, in fact, that when researchers have gone to study snakes in those regions, they found significantly fewer snakes, including some species that were just entirely absent from that area, because they ate a lot of frogs, and if there's no frogs, they're gonna starve. Even with the snakes I work with, the federally threatened narrow-headed garter snake, we have to check those when we find them in the field and make sure they don't have a fungus that infects snakes, because obviously if they got infected and they're already threatened, that would probably make them endangered, or extinct in the wild at least. And even in humans, we're pretty used to at least some fungal infections. For example, athlete's foot is just one of those things that people just kind of accept, but you don't really think of as being a fungus because you don't really see the mushroom of it, or at least not thinking of it in the same way. Cordyceps, though, does grow an actual mushroom once it kills its host. And the thing is, it has a lot of hosts, but there's only a few of them that actually get turned into zombies. And that's because many of them are more isolated animals. So when you're thinking about cordyceps infecting animals, if it's infecting a beetle, there's no other beetles that are gonna take that beetle that's infected out back and deal with the problem there. Same thing with flies. But ants and wasps do have these social communities where that kind of process of taking the infected one out back and dealing with the problem does happen. This kind of defensive behavior and guarding against this fungus is so strong in some ants that they'll actually just drag the infected animal away once it starts to show symptoms of infection, kill it, and then the two ants that dragged it out there kill themselves because they also might be infected now and they don't want to infect the rest of the colony. It's something that you can actually see and we're thinking about in The Last of Us it jumping to humans and humans obviously would have some defense against being able to have it spread widely. I mean, it's a dark part of the whole universe of The Last of Us, but it makes sense that there would be some zombification. But the zombification in ants doesn't happen the same way it does in The Last of Us, where they're running around trying to bite people, or in this case, biting other ants to spread the fungus. Instead, what happens with the fungus is they climb up into trees, bite into the veins of those trees, or the main arteries, essentially, where there's more water flow, because those are the tougher parts of the plant. And then from there, you start actually getting the sprouting of the mushroom that releases spores into the wind, which hopefully for the fungus, infects more ants. And we see this kind of eruption of mushrooms happening from ants as far back as about 50 million years ago in some Baltic amber, where there's one specific ant that has a mushroom erupting from it. Now in general, in most of the modern ones, they do sprout more from the head, and some arguments are made that, hey, it's controlling the nerves. Other arguments are, oh, hey, it's controlling the muscles that are all in these tube-like bodies in the exoskeleton, because as long as the mushroom and the fungus can put controls down there, it can pull the muscles however it wants. But regardless, we can't actually tell if this one was mind controlled because it's not actively attached to a leaf or something similar in order to actually grow that mushroom and spread spores. Now there are other examples of this from Baltic Amber, including some things that are in like bark insects and things like that, like these other kinds of insects that just don't live communally the same way that ants do. And it's actually really interesting because we don't know the exact date on this amber, Essentially, what had happened is it had been deposited, it eroded out of a hill, and then was redeposited somewhere else. So what happens is we need to look into there at some of the pollen that's inside of it and try and estimate a date based on that kind of palynology. There's a lot of people who are really smart who do that kind of stuff. I'm not an expert on it, though. 
That said, there are some fossils that help to narrow down zombification to about that same time period, only a few million years later and about 48 million years ago. And this is really because of fossils coming from Germany in the Messel Pit. The Messel Pit was a volcanic lake that was super toxic on the bottom, meaning fossils that sink all the way to the bottom were really well preserved because the kinds of things that break down fossils, they weren't there. So the fossils were really well preserved and that means we actually have some plant fossils from there. And one of these has the telltale signs of being bitten and hung onto by ants. So if you remember I was talking about these ants coming up and biting onto the hardest parts of plant leaves, that's what we see in this fossil coming from the mussel pit. These kinds of large cuts jagged into the sides of many of those main parts of the plant leaf. Now, some people might go, oh, it's a leaf cutter ant. And interestingly, leaf cutter ants do use fungus. They actually use the leaf parts they cut to grow their own fungus that they then eat. But these aren't leaf cutter ant bite marks. Like I said, it's really only on the sturdiest parts of this plant leaf where we see these kinds of bite marks. So by at least 48 million years ago, the zombification had begun. And there's still gonna be some questions as to how exactly that happened. Because we have fossils that show cordyceps infections, not necessarily in ants, go back twice as far beyond that again. Back to 100 million years ago with some of the Burmese amber that's being found with a lot of really great fossils in it. There are some ethical questions. If you're interested, you can check out my video on that on whichever side the little thing pops up. But regardless, it is something that's really cool to see, although this time it's not in an ant. Instead, this time it's a scale insect. And the thing is, this amber does have ants in it. It just doesn't have ants with this infection. So maybe this is around the time that cordyceps was really getting started in a lot of these animals that would have been in a more rainforesty, damp type environment, and then spreading to other ones of the same species just because of how common they would have been in the forest. In fact, there's so-called hell ants that are also found in this amber. The hell ants had a weird biting mechanism and also were larger than most modern ants. And it seems like they may have also not been quite as social. And so maybe that's kind of the shift that was happening that let cordyceps start infecting ants. Because in addition to hell ants, we do have more modern type ants that would have been more social. So this kind of shift may have facilitated cordyceps to begin spreading into these colonies even more effectively. Additionally, this find in this Burmese amber is really useful because this Burmese amber is 100 million years old, give or take. And based on the genetic data, it seems like cordyceps actually split from other fungi about 130 million years ago. So it had 30 million years at least to become much more diverse and much more common, at least in some environments. This time during the Cretaceous was also really notable for having a lot of angiosperms first really start developing. The angiosperms are the flowering trees, so basically if it has a fruit that's not a pine cone of some variety, it's an angiosperm. This kind of diversification of the angiosperms is also associated with a broad diversification of insects, which makes sense. There's going to be more habitat and more variety in forests for different insects to occupy different niches. But then also we get few million years after that, that diversification of parasitic fungi. And it's not just cordyceps in this case, it's many different kinds of parasitic fungi. And so they also then were able to spread. So what does all this mean for human potential infections of cordyceps? Well, we need to understand that really it's the flowering trees fault. The fact that we have apples today, but also grains is really what caused cordyceps to be able to start diversifying into these different insects. It also means that we're probably not that likely to get infected by cordyceps. First, if it did jump different species, you'd expect people to first become antisocial because they don't want to get detected, but then go up to the top of tall buildings and have mushrooms explode from their head and have spores get sent all across Phoenix or New York or Boston or wherever you happen to be, which those could potentially be dealt with by antifungal agents. The thing is, fungus and animals are pretty closely related. There's this kind of tendency to think of fungi as being between plants and animals, but no, they're much closer to animals. In fact, they breathe the same way. They take in oxygen and respire or get rid of carbon dioxide. So really similar anatomy, but it also means a lot of their toxins are also toxic to us. So that would be one of the major issues if there was this kind of jump into humans. But that kind of jump into humans would be really, really strange because cordyceps isn't that diverse in what it infects. Sure, there is some diversity. It can actually even infect spiders, which aren't insects, but are arachnids. But then basically the only other thing it infects are insects. So you have two different arthropod groups that are always being infected by cordyceps. And with different species of cordyceps, each species only infects one species. 
Even a cordyceps species that infects ants, it will only infect one species of ant. It will not jump into different ants. And sure, this has happened at least occasionally in the fossil record just because of the diversity we have, but it's not super common. It's not like they're just jumping to new species every other week. And I do want to take this moment to point out that ant anatomy is very, very different from human anatomy. I, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I am not an ant. So it's not that likely that you'd be able to get a fungus that really specializes on relatively simple animals, a lot of worker ants, and is able to pump chemicals into their very small brains that it would be able to jump into mammals, which have an entirely different body setup, and then also pump similar chemicals into their brains and also control them. Because the brain is just more complicated. And sure, there could very well be chemicals that could influence behavior, but I think getting quite to the zombie level is a little outrageous. So as much as it surficially makes sense that cordyceps could jump to humans and infect people, it's far more likely that the real patient zero for a human's cordyceps type fungus isn't gonna come from an ant or even a beetle. Instead, it's probably gonna come from something we already have, like athlete's foot, or the fungus that I had in my ear when I was seven that, you know, maybe it could have just jumped into the brain and I'm totally not a zombie person trying to tell you more about paleontology because obviously that makes you a productive member of society and fungus wouldn't want that.